Moby Dick or the Whale by Herman Melville. Chapter seven, the chapel. In this same New Bedford, there stands a whaleman's chapel and few are the moody fishermen shortly bound for the Indian Ocean or Pacific who fail to make a Sunday visit to the spot. I am sure that I did not. Returning from my first morning stroll, I again sallied out upon this special errand. The sky had changed from clear, sunny, cold to driving sleet and mist. Wrapping myself in my shaggy jacket of the cloth called bearskin, I fought my way against the stubborn storm. Entering, I found a small scattered congregation of sailors and sailors' wives and widows. A muffled silence reigned, only broken at times by the shrieks of the storm. Each silent worshiper seemed purposely sitting apart from the other as if each silent grief were insular and incommunicable. The chaplain had not yet arrived and there these silent islands of men and women sat steadfastly eyeing several marble tablets with black borders masoned into the wall on either side of the pulpit. Three of them ran something like the following, but I do not pretend to quote. Sacred to the memory of John Talbot, who at the age of 18 was lost overboard near the Isle of Desolation off Patagonia, November 1st, 1836. This tablet is erected to his memory by his sister. Sacred to the memory of Robert Long, Willis Ellery, Nathan Coleman, Walter Canney, Seth Macy, and Samuel Gleig, forming one of the boat's crews of the ship Eliza, who were towed out of sight by a whale on the offshore ground in the Pacific, December 31st, 1839. This marble is here placed by their surviving shipmates sacred to the memory of the late Captain Ezekiel Hardy, who in the bows of his boat was killed by a sperm whale on the coast of Japan, August 3rd, 1833. This tablet is erected to his memory by his widow. Shaking off the sleet from my ice glazed hat and jacket, I seated myself near the door turning sideways, was surprised to see Queequeg near me. Affected by the solemnity of the scene, there was a wondering gaze of incredulous curiosity in his countenance. This savage was the only person present who seemed to notice my entrance because he was the only one who could not read and therefore was not reading those frigid inscriptions on the wall whether any of the relatives of the seamen whose names appeared there were now among the congregation, I knew not, but so many are the unrecorded accidents in the fishery, and so plainly did several women present, or several women present, where the countenance, if not the trappings, of some unceasing grief, that I feel sure that here before me were assembled those in whose unhealing hearts the sight of those bleak tablets sympathetically caused the old wounds to bleed afresh. Oh, ye whose, whose dead lie buried beneath the green grass, who standing among flowers can say, here, here lies my beloved. You know not the desolation that broods in bosoms like these. What bitter blanks in those black bordered marbles which cover no ashes. What despair in those immovable inscriptions. What deadly voids and un 
forbidden infidelities and the lines that seem to gnaw upon all faith and refuse resurrections to the beings who have placelessly perished without a grave. As well might those tablets stand in the cave of Elephanta as here. In what census of living creatures, the dead of mankind are included, why it is that a universal proverb says of them that they tell no tales, though containing more secrets than the good wind sands, how is it that to his name who yesterday departed for the other world, we prefix so significant and infidel a word and yet do not thus entitle him if he but embarks for the remotest indies of this living earth. Why the life insurance companies pay death forfeitures upon immortals in what eternal unstirring paralysis and deadly hopeless trance yet lies antique Adam who died 60 round centuries ago? How is it? that we still refuse to be comforted for those who we nevertheless maintain are dwelling in unspeakable bliss. Why all the living so strive to hush all the dead? Wherefore, but the rumor of a knocking in a tomb will terrify a whole city. All these things are not without their meanings. But faith like a jackal feeds among the tombs, and even from those dead doubts, she gathers her most vital hope. It needs scarcely to be told with what feelings on the eve of a Nantucket voyage I regarded those marble tablets, and by the murky light of that darkened, doleful day, read the fate of the whalemen who had gone before me. Yes, Ishmael, the same fate may be thine. But somehow I grew merry again. Delightful inducements to embark. Fine chance for promotion, it seems. I, a stove boat, will make me an immortal by brevet. Yes, there is death in this business of whaling. A speechlessly quick chaotic bundling of a man into eternity. But what then? Methinks we have hugely mistaken this matter of life and death. Methinks that what they call my shadow here on earth is my true substance. Methinks that in looking at things spiritual, we are too much like oysters observing the sun through the water and thinking that thick water the thinnest of air. Methinks my body is but the lees of my better being. In fact, take my body, who will? Take it, I say, it is not me. And therefore, three cheers for Nantucket. And come a stove boat and a stove body when they will. For stave my soul, Jove himself cannot. <laughs>